Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's Grubby here. This is just a little bit of a heads up. Um, <laughs> I was recording this interview. For some reason, my PC decided to switch my microphone from the lovely, sexy Yeti to my headset. So as a result, uh, my sound quality just suddenly goes bleh. I've tried to fix it up as best I can. It's not brilliant. My apologies to both you, the audience, and to Mira, who uh, was very, very lovely. So that's irritating. Um, yeah, sorry to everyone. I hope it's listenable. I hope you enjoy. This is a really strange episode. Bye. <laughs> Disclaimer. This is the second attempt at recording this podcast. As a result, there will be multiple health warnings and no sign of Giant Daddy Haystacks, a wrestler that does not exist. Everything to do with black holes. Sometimes Paddington Bear. And of course, there will probably be absolutely no mention of anything involving... Enjoy the show. Bye. First here, then there, right on your mind already. I love It is once again me, your favorite Bram Stoker lookalike, as I sit here, wait, this isn't a cathedral, this is an obliette, why am I suddenly in an obliette? Ah, I'm not alone, hello there, other person inside the obliette. Hello, I'm wonderful this evening, will you have some Battenberg cake and a cup of Ibiza with me? Ah, Battenberg and warm riding. <laughs> I applaud, I applaud. That's, uh, that's very well. I quite like the idea that down here in the Obliette we have cake in Ribena. Well, it was it's, hot Ribena, but you're rather later than expected because this was this is a reschedule. It was hot when you first when we first. <laughs> it was hot two weeks ago. And now it's tepid. I should say who I am, shouldn't I? <laughs> oh, well, uh, right now you're the, uh, the shadowy figure in the Oubliette, giving ghostly cake and tepid ribbing. The Mrs. Doyle of Oubliette. <laughs> ah, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. See, now I'm just thinking of Mrs. Doyle as a banshee, just sh- shrieking go on at the, uh, the sign of someone's now death. Now I'm thinking of a craggy <laughs> island RPG. <gasps> <laughs> Oh, Father, I hear you're a barbarian oh, now. Father Ted. No, Father's dead. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you not remember that time when all the goblins came along? Oh, the, the, the three up the cliff. The, the three off the cliff. Do you not remember? Do you not remember? Uh... This minotaur is small. Those minotaurs are far away. <laughs> That's it. We've done it. Written. Yeah, absolutely. Although I really do like, ah, evil Death Lord. I hear you're a racist now. <laughs> oh, I missed that show. <laughs> yeah, it's just a shame that the uh, guy behind it became such a, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, one of those. Damaged goods. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, so hello, my name is Mira. Hello, Mira. I am one of the editors, among other things that I do, I am one of the editors of the online mag 28 which mm-hmm. is a celebration of art, all things from the Grimdark 28 hobby. Um, Inquisitors are us and all that. <coughs> and your lovely uh, establishment kindly gave us an award 
and it was such a lovely boost to our spirits. Could you remind us what we won our award for? Uh, it was the... Now, you've got me on the back foot here because I can't remember the exact wording of it. It was the Independent Creator Award. Yay! And um, it's really, really nice um, because everyone who works on 28 is a volunteer. Not only are they mm -hmm. damn talented artists and creators in their own right, but they are so passionate and they come from all over the world. Um, Finland, America, UK, just getting together to promote an, the, the hobby and art from contributors. Mm -hmm. So when we saw your award, that was really lovely. And we did a retweet. And that's how you and I kind of got together through Twitter messaging, yeah. really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We started talking and next thing you know, it's talking about trebuchets and catapults, which is a recurring theme I've noticed in our conversations. Yeah, well, you know. Everyone always, it's the age old, which is better, a trebuchet or a catapult? And the answer is, you want one of each, really? Or are you even well, in the you, game? Well, obviously, you want a catapult for the week, and then you want to get your Sunday best trebuchet out. I like that. Very <laughs> civilised. No, we only trebuchet on Sundays. Excuse me, sir. I, mean, I see that your trebuchet only comes out on a Sunday. Is there a reason for that? Well, you see, in my day, you only got the trebuchet out on Sundays because that was the day that the French were coming. Okay? I'm not saying that they're just godless, faithless, wild monsters, but, you know, that's the day the French came. Oh, I see. That's most, uh, that's most alarming. And um, it being 1973, why are you still firing things at the French? Well, you know, I'm it's tired. Oh, 1973. What a soundtrack to those trebuchet barrages, though. <laughs> There's nothing like, nothing like a little bit of Mark Boland playing as trebuchets are firing masonry across the channel. Gosh, you couldn't fire something across the channel. It is a Sunday best trebuchet. You don't have big Some it is. kind of Back to the Future style nitro fusion nuclear trebuchet. Yes, unfortunately, uh, as you start to fire it, the Assad terrorists come after you because you've stolen all their plutonium. I have to say, I am not a fan of historic wargaming. Don't no. at me. Don't at me, people. But <laughs> WTF. You could have a fight through the galaxy. You could have a fight mm -hmm. through a fantastical mm -hmm. land where you ride a war dragon. Or you could play mm -hmm. the French Legionnaires in a famous fight when we were trying to uh, take the Suez Canal. Was it dark mm -hmm. by then? I don't know. What I enjoy in the hobby... Uh... And it's the same with competitive gaming. I like narrative gaming. My joy and my passion when it comes to this type of thing is always the story that gets told. And I think one of the reasons I can't, I've never been able to get into historical gaming is because that story has already been told, and it's been told in reality. And I always kind of feel a little bit grimy trying to replace the entertainment value, a thing that actually had people yeah, told. Yeah, it's, it's terrifying and horrible. I think if I, you know, if there was an option to play D&D &D and not have combat, I would even feel more comfortable with that. And that's fantasy killing. I mean, one of my favorite ever games was this amazing DM called Dragon, not her real name, but a very fitting DM mm -hmm. name. She ran a one shot session of One Ring and it was called mm -hmm. Adventures in Hobbiton. And we all played Hobbits and all we had to do was go around the Shire gathering ingredients for a pie competition. And that was... Okay. The, Slightly my speed, so <laughs> a, a, you know, a girl like me being slung into the grim dark is not happy, but it's still better than historical gaming. I, you've reminded me there of the fact that we once, um, much to the chagrin of my DM at the time, we entered a city. I think this would have been third ed D and D. Showing your age. Mm -hmm. I'm an old man. I'm about to turn to dust. Um, and any minute now, the ancient spirits of evil will turn me into some kind of buff superhero so I can go and beat up the Thundercats. Yeah, it would have been, would have been third ed. And we stopped the quest, the story, dead center in the middle for about, I want to say three months. As we, in this big old city that we were in, became the world's greatest ram raiding gang. And all we did was, with our horse and carts, would be ram raid shops at night and just build up armor and. Uh, Accessories. And you never got caught or thrown into prison? Uh, well, we almost got caught a couple of times. The helpful thing was that the uh, what we'd do is we'd get lots of people in you know, under the impression that we were like a proper team of thieves. And then as soon as the police would arrive, we'd vamoose and leave all the other people to be arrested. 
don't trust players who sacrifice the NPCs, kids. What got really good was the uh, the character I played would spend most of his time just going, go and see to yourself, one of us. Go and see to yourself, one of the questy boys. But, um, <laughs> I remember that edition as having quite a lot of alignment stuff going on there. It did, it did, yeah. yeah. So you were all wrong and you were all evil. Oh, what we did to the field paladin was just horrible. This, this <laughs> lawful paladin just slowly ended up, became tarnished and decayed. Mean. Oh, that's all right. He, he was being haunted twice by the ghost of his dead father. Um, he was being haunted actually by his ghost, and he was also in the middle, because he was turning from lawful to chaotic, um, in the middle of a massive crisis of faith, which was causing what he thought his dead father would be saying to him to haunt him. Oh, my lord. Paladin is, of course, Lord Soth from the Dragonlance Chronicles. Mm-hmm. Very troubled character, indeed. I think you'll find the best paladin that's ever been around ever is uh, Sir Neville Smythe from the Flight of Dragons. Can we do a Twitter poll on that? Yes. Yes, we can. Because I, I, will, I will dress as Sir Neville Smythe just in order to get that to win. Oh, man. Okay, if you do <laughs> do that, you will deserve that win. I will need to one shave all my beard off so I can grow a really big twirly moustache and look slightly like Tom Selleck. But I'll do my best. Tom Selleck. And we're talking early 80s Tom Selleck, you know. Magnum P.I.? Mm, just just before. Okay. Wow. I will. Ha- I would have to research him prior to Magnum. I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> it's just far too much fun talking to you, Adam. I don't know what we're supposed <laughs> to be talking about. I've, you know, I've, I've got the Thundercats theme in my head and Mumra the Ever Living. Where, where are we going? Thunder, thunder, thunder. At oh, this moment, I'm going to tell you where to start a Thundercats musical. You know, thunder, thunder, that is where we sit. My name's Lionel and I don't swear like da 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 do 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 do. Let's talk about 28 for a minute. Yes. So 28 is a massive grimoire of the grim dark, showing lots of different elements of people's artistry, people's work. Uh, people's interests, ranging from fiction writing to articles about people's journeys through to um, some absolutely stunning model work and paint jobs uh, and people's art. Where on earth did the idea come from at the very, very genesis of this that somebody turned around and went, do you know what the world needs? It needs more. It's interesting because, you know, I have to put a disclaimer here. I am in no Mm. way part of the the you know the beginning mm-hmm. of the 28 i have come along when it's already thriving and you know quite respected and revered from what i can understand these characters that are the actual you know the main forces behind the, the magazine um just have a love of 28 but mm-hmm. they also have a they're very very much steeped in the kind of culture that goes with that like yeah. Those very famous old black and white movies that are just really, really disturbing, I think I could say. I remember I had my first 28 meeting and mm-hmm. I met all the, the staffers and everything. She said they were all volunteers. Um, and I was very honest and I said, I come from a place of Dungeons and Dragons. My, I love unicorns. I play bars. Uh, I think you know i think i'll be a great editor because i'll be learning as i go and i'll be bringing kind of my editorial skills across and learning at the same time and they were really massively supportive but the amount of really i don't know if debauched is the right word it was not debauched but really deeply horrific terrorizing dark relentlessly hopeless you know just you know the world is a crushing act of suffering what you're saying is, uh, Brummies. <laughs> I would never, I would never say that. Oh, well, I would. I would. If, if uh, you know, if you want to know what the crushing despair of the forty-first millennium is actually like, go and spend a weekend in Wolfhound. Oh my lord! Oh my lord! I'm <laughs> glad that you said that. Oh, I've, I've said that for twenty years. <laughs> Everybody who listens to me knows my uh, my feelings on Wolverhampton. Oh my god. Well, I mean, they they just absolutely love the macabre and anything that's a bit chilling and a bit off. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some of the concepts that come through in the mag, you know, it's these yeah. grotesque imaginings of, like, dark and dank corners of the universe. 
that are just utterly without hope. Um, I find as well that it's not just that it's um, dark and dank. It, it, there's a, a real sense of contrast that takes place within the, the 28 issues. It's beautifully grotesque. You know, it's stunningly dark. It, there's, there's no um, grotesquerie for the sake of grotesquerie. There is grotesquerie through the eyes of somebody who finds it beautiful. And that is an incredible talent to be able to get that across on the page, just from the layouts, just from the way it's all set out. And it is absolutely gorgeous and somewhat off-putting, but also very inviting, but also terrifying to be able to go through something like that. It's, it's definitely an aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And it's all around Inquisitor 28. Mm -hmm. um, and we have arguments about, you know, can turnips be an issue or not? You know, those kind <laughs> of minutiae. But very much, you know, the kind of films I'd probably avoid, like, you know, Brazil. Is it Terry? What's his name? Terry Gilliam. Yeah, that kind of like, I mean, one of the things we did recently was a challenge to, we asked artists to send in what it would be like if you would, had a menial task. In mm -hmm. you know, in the grim dark and that kind of whole really bureaucratic Brazil vibe, you know. So I just think that the impetus was that these very talented painters, hobbyists came together through that and the celebration of that. Um they've really just created a space for I mean, I don't I don't know enough, but I think having having mm -hmm you know, some individuals who really appreciate the culture and the aesthetic as mm -hmm. you described it and collating that and presenting it so beautifully, it almost elevates it to allow us to talk about it, you know, more with more pride and the artwork of our hobby. Because, you yeah. know, a lot of the time, if you're into this hobby, you're seen as like a wargaming nerd who mm -hmm. paints miniatures. And yeah. if you leaf through you know the e-pages of 28 it is presented as this you know it's like a, a trip into another world and you know i'm quite um absolutely it, it reminds me of a lot of my favorite 70s albums artwork not in an artistic mm -hmm. style but when you're looking through artwork for album covers or books from the 1970s it takes you into a completely different universe and just transports you there. And I think that's the beauty of 28. It completely immerses you and just shows some stunning, gorgeous visuals and brings people together. You know, mm -hmm. the essays, there's so much passion in the project and that really shows through the talent and the colours and the absence of colours. And I chose this colour scheme because it represents this, this and this. It's just, just a fabulous celebration. It is. It really is. And I think there's a place in the world for being able to look at what is somewhere halfway between neo-Gothic and um, decayed... Oh, the word has just gone out of my head. Uh, de decay artistry. And it just locks together in this really nice way when it comes to 28. And it, the moment you, you open up an issue... Uh, I mean, the, the one downside I'll always say about 28 is I want to hold it in my hands. I want to smell the paper. I want to open it up and just like dripping things to fall out. You want uh, a snow globe of it. Oh, can you imagine? Rosebud. <sighs> I mean, we are trying to, you know, I don't want to spoil anything, but we are trying to create more tangible products mm -hmm. from 28. That would so be you can amazing. Hold things. That would be amazing. It really would. It, it would be absolutely stunning to see. Because I mean, you've got um, uh, magazines like Blaster that come out every. Uh, six months, I think it is. Yeah. He says. Um, but the downside to that is, I think they're like £12 an issue. You know, because it is a really difficult thing to get out for such a small print run. Um, but it, it, it would be a wonderful thing to see and just be able to, to hold this dark, decaying grimoire of the the 41st millennium and beyond. Because, I mean, you, you guys have had some AOS in there as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's, I mean, we get a lot of submissions. We have to be quite mm -hmm. careful because a lot of stuff is trademarked. And then if, of you, course. if you print or publish and you're talking about trademark things, that can get you into mm -hmm. trouble. But I think we receive so many submissions. And yes, you know, there is like, there are like ideas of what we like to include. But if, so 
something stunning comes through and it's discussed, it will it will come through. So yeah, yeah. you never really know what you're going to find. Um, I'm particularly proud of our. This is for the second year running. We've managed to do a special limited edition um, International Women's Day. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's like a supplement, really. And we only had like really a month to work on it, inviting submissions from you know talented artists. And the fact that we're able to do that now and well, that, that you can ask and people trust us with their creations, they trust us to handle yeah. the subject of International Women's Day sensitively and wave the flags that we want to wave around that. Really, of course, yeah. Yeah. But I do oh. hope, I hope at some point that you get to speak to other, you know, other members of the 28 team because they're just scarily knowledgeable about the universe they know everybody that's ever painted a thing or written a thing or dreamt of a concept of a thing and you know i learned so much from them and as a team they're really bloody resilient i mean i know the whole world is going through hard times but everyone's busy no one has much money and everyone still gets together to make 28 happen it's like that's maybe a slightly communist thing to say but i think it's very important as well to be able to um, create a product that doesn't involve money it's being made for the love of making it as much as i'm pretty sure that everyone involved would like to make money out of it yeah. because, because let's face it we're all in that position where we desperately would like some extra cash flow coming through um, it's why i'm going to start up my brand new uh, adventure of seal clubbing holidays uh, where you you and a seal uh, go to a rave all night thank god it switched at the end well, well, well do you think it was going to go somewhere horrible I mean, what happens between the person and the seal at the end of the night is entirely beyond them. Glorify yeah, yeah, that poor seal and have it orbiting in space to take over a planet or something. That's what generally happens with these things. But no, twenty eight. Right, right. Okay. No, no, no. You give me you give me an idea here, right? So it's the plot of Star Trek, the first Star Trek motion picture. But it, uh, oh no, it's not. It was the voyage home, wasn't it? That the thing came back looking for whales. Right. It's come back to Terra. Holy terror sit there, all lasers pointing upwards, and this like mechanical voice just comes through. Bring me your seals. It's too late, we killed them all. <gasps> and do you know what would happen? You'd have seals in Terminator armor because they would have purity seals. Oh, yes, my. yes, it's a winner. It's a winner. There we go. What can have we opened? A can of seals, apparently. Much bigger than a can of worms. Oh, uh, you know how. I got to write for them now. Isn't that mad? Is it just one of those things where one day you weren't and the next day you were? Yeah, I literally cannot remember. I think it, it probably happened in lockdown. I think mm. they they have so many submissions, Adam. It's insane. I can and, imagine. I can imagine. Yeah, so I was able to jump on the team. And because I'm... I'm quite used to writing and editing. I just was able to jump in there quite fast and, and take my portion of them. And mm-hmm. then I'm just like being drawn into this scary, strange universe. But yeah, the point I was making earlier is that, that they gave me some really gruesome films to watch. Very, very dark black and white movies. But what, what like? What like? Oh, gosh, oh, I'm going to have to look it up in, in my Discord. I'm hoping that like one of them was... Um... Yeah, it's a wonderful life. No, they were like, there was a lot of bloodletting. Oh, the uh, Tetsuo the Iron Man, that's the one I was thinking of. No, it, it, they were like really like 20s and things, you know? All right. Um, like the age of hard to be a god was one of them. Uh, so one of the artists wrote to me, mm-hmm. Hey Mira, I asked Alex what movie he shared with you. And wow, that is grim art dark to another level. I'd never think of hard to be a god as light affair, but compared to what little I watched of Begotten, it's much more digestible. So Begotten, I would advise your listeners not to look up either. Begotten is a 1989 American experimental horror film. It employs a style similar in some ways to early silent films. Right, okay. Listen to this. This is proper grimdark. Drawn from elements of various creation myths. Opens with the suicide of a godlike figure and the birth of Mother Earth and the Son of Earth, who set out on a journey of death and rebirth through a barren landscape. 
my you know Care Bears movie. It is not. <laughs> it's not the last unicorn. Oh, I love the last unicorn. Ship from- last unicorn. Last unicorn. Uh, the last unicorn by Peter S. Beagle is one of my mm-hmm. favourite novels. It's actually really brilliantly written. Fantastic. Somewhere, Giles' ears have just pricked up. Just, um, Who's that? A friend of mine, uh, Jai, he is a massive. Um, well, we, we basically met through a shared love of the Flight of Dragons, uh, which is I don't care what anyone says, the finest animated film ever made. So shut up, all the years. Okay. Uh, nowhere else do you have uh, a guy being merged with the dragon because they both had a spell cast on them, and then a dragon having to teach the dragon how to be a dragon. It is the best film ever made. God damn it. Uh, but The Last Unicorn was made by all the same people who did The Fight of Dragons. It is like oh. a pseudo-sequel, but not. Um, and as a result, there's a lot of love. And so every time Flight of Dragons or Last Unicorn gets mentioned, Jai's ears prick up in Glasgow and he just goes, oh, what? Oh, have you read the book? Yes. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, but, well, both of them actually. Yeah, the Last Unicorn and the Flight of Dragons are both in- incredible books. Yeah, I think uh, one of my favourite lines from that book is the butterfly re- meets the unicorn, and the unicorn says, "You know, what am I?" Because the unicorn's mm-hmm. trying to figure mm-hmm. it out, and the, the butterfly says something like, "Your name is a golden bell in my heart. You know, I would die to, to let it ring again, or something like this." It's such mm-hmm. a beautiful line. Although you just reminded me, I have the Wizard of Earthsea um, oh. collected, which I haven't. I mean, I read it way back when I was in secondary school, but I've got it in hardback here and I still haven't started it. I've had it for two years. I need to get onto that. That's my next book to start. I mean, I I am a big fan of Ursula Le Guin, and mm-hmm. I absolutely loved Wizard of Earthsea when I was a little one. And actually, I wouldn't say it's grimdark, but it's, it, it follows... Taoism, I think, Taoism philosophy, mm-hmm. which is actually is very beautiful philosophy, but also quite, you know, not dark, but just accepting a lot of surrender yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, a lot of um, elements of seeing that there are things that you will be able to change and won't be able to do this about, and having to accept the fact that these things will happen to both you and people around you, and you're going to be powerless against them, but not to let it have power over you. Yeah. Yeah, oh gosh, Ursula Le Guin is just elegant and stunning mm-hmm. and beautiful. Well, I mean, that's that's the entire point at the end of the first book of Wizard of Earth, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Not letting something powerful have power over you. I remember feeling <laughs> a, a, a catacomb. Uh, you know, I remember feeling this thing where I've, I'd read many, many, many fantasy books, which were probably, I don't know, you didn't have young adult back when I started reading those books, but you knew that the, there would be a happy ending. You knew that the baddie would be. Mm-hmm. And reading Wizard of Earth, see, I felt something click in my mind and be like, oh, you know, stories can have these complex human endings. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Out of interest, I mean, once again, and this happened exactly last time as well, I had a set idea of where I was going to take this, and we just went off the beaten track, and that's fine, because <laughs> conversation is always more interesting than interviews. Um <laughs> And I, I'm remembering I need to say stuff about, you know, various clubs and shit as well. Oh, you, don't worry. It's all, it's all in here. Yeah, I know where we're um, going. You're the responsible adult, and I love you and I trust you on this journey. Thank you for driving the train. <laughs> to train? I thought this was a lorry. Um, <laughs> this is the worst bus I've ever been on. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever come across, uh, actually, two, two series of books, which I think uh, might be worth getting into? The Lockwood uh, series, which no, that, that looks like there's no recognition there. Lockwood, did you say? Yeah, Lockwood and Co. Yeah. No, I'm not right. familiar. Right, a uh, young adult series, but don't let you, that put you off. Okay. It's um, set after a ghost apocalypse. By right? Jonathan Stroud. That's the one. He's the same writer who wrote the famous book. Oh, he's not. Oh, how funny. I put him down as I want to read a book that he's written called The Amulet of Samarkand. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, I'm feeling good about this. Tell me more about yes. Lockwood and Co. So it's a ghost apocalypse um, where every night ghosts will appear and there's the world has had to adapt to ghosts. You've got things like ghost lights, which um, they shine and show ghosts whenever they're about. Uh, and you can't go out at night. 
or if you do, you've got to take a ghost cab, which is protected. Um, and these different companies go out to rid places of hauntings. Lockwood is a 18 year old boy or so who um, is basically trying to run his own company after his parents mysteriously died. Um, and it's all done through the point of a young lass who experienced some truly awful, horrible things as she came to London and joined up. Uh, and it's like this interplay between the different companies, but there's also a truly terrifying ghost apocalypse happening. Um, and then it's the interplay between the, the characters themselves. When I say there is a sequence involving a shopping center, which to this day terrifies me, and this is a young adult book, and I'm oh, 40. Adam, it was going so well, and now I'm going to be terrified? It, it's, I mean, the, the, they are really, really good books, right? They are superb. Okay, well, look, right? um, I've, I've added it to my Goodreads, The Screaming oh, Staircase. Oh, The Screaming Staircase, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm on Goodreads as Mirror Manga. So, mm -hmm. yes, because you know I love my books. But uh, I'll talk about another of my favourite uh, books of all time. It's called Bridge mm -hmm. of Birds by a guy called uh, Barry Hewitt. And he wrote three beautiful, fantastic, stunning books set in like ye olde times in, you know, far, far east and magic happens and dragons come to life. They're just stunning. Three perfect, stunning books with fantastic characters, loads and loads of humour, beautifully written. And he got pissed off with publishing and he was like, I'm not making any money from this. And he stopped writing books. But Bridge of Birds, yes. it's, 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 it's not high fantasy. It's just, it's like Terry Pratchett, but more beautiful and whimsical and a bit more love story. Yeah, it, it doesn't have the, the beating heart of rage that Pratchett had. No. But we will we will always talk about Pratchett, you and I. So did you just I, th I think so. So what's the other what's the other series? Yes, uh, The Name of the Wind. Yes, of right. course. Patrick Rothfuss. Paul which, of Besiege I, Paddy. Patrick, yeah. where is your yeah. next book, Patrick, who is not allowed to do anything? He <laughs> goes to conventions and everyone goes, Where's the book? And um Did you see his Twitch stream when he was doing the charity stuff? And he was reading out new one. I didn't watch it because spoilers, mm -hmm. but um, I am really, really hopeful, but I'm very, very scared at the same time because mm -hmm. Name of the Wind was, wasn't it perfect? It is. It's a perfect book. And then last book I read, you know, I was a bit like, Come on. I think I'm just so fascinated how all the loose ends will be tied up. Y yes. Yeah. But it, it's not like a um, Game of Thrones type moment where, there's so much in the air that it seems impossible that it's already a tied up. And I don't think it will in Game of Thrones' case. It feels more that the strongest points of that book have kind of intertwined in a way that I don't see how you can untwine it to get to the end. I would be but, fucking pissed off if it's not twined. <laughs> I need it. Yeah. I do need that to happen. Out of interest, have you ever come across The Spook's Apprentice? The Spook's Apprentice? Mm -hmm. There's another series of books which I would highly recommend. It's all uh, uh, heavy British mythology. It's set around Yorkshire, Pendle, which, if anyone knows their history, is where the witches were all hung. Are these Joseph Delaney books? That's the ones. Okay, I'm going to add that. I'm. Oh, let's look at that. I've got that down as a want to read as well. <laughs> um, is it? Spook's Apprentice is very, very good. Is it YA? I think it's very easy for books to be pigeonholed into why a young adult fiction when they are just fiction. Right, yeah. As I say, it's a 40-year-old man. I thoroughly enjoy the Lockwood series. I think it's amazing and it creeps me out. Um, same with Spook's Apprentice. The, uh, mother, the, uh, the mother to this day is still one of these things that makes my spine shiver. Oh. Just this witch that wanders through the, the grass. <laughs> I don't like it. Don't do the sound. No. Oh, it's, oh, it's, oh, my it's very creepy. Well, They're leaving a trail like a slug. Well, it's all. I will trust you. I think it's always good when we talk about books. The last time we spoke about Pratchett and your suggestion mm. for a black library book, which, which mm -hmm. was The Infinite and the Divine. The Infinite and the Divine is the next yeah. book, and I took that to Arbiter Ian. 
whose mm-hmm. YouTube, whose YouTube a channel I'm invited on to do book club with him, and he put it on his Patreon mm-hmm. up against some quite good titles. I thought from the Black Library, and it literally, I think, I think it won with 28 votes, and the closest <laughs> runner-up had 14 votes. Mm-hmm. So to me, that says that that book must be quite iconic. It's the infinite for something that came out maybe 18 months ago. It is one of those books I have gone back to twice because it's such a ride. Okay. The, the best way to describe it is that somehow in the last maybe four years, Black Library went up a level. They probably leveled up. And a lot of the, the bolt upon stuff that they have done in the past kind of got dropped and jettisoned. So um, is bolt upon like Gaunt's Ghost? No, gone. Anything by Dabnet is always a step above. So you know that stuff, Ravenor, um, the Inquisition stuff. That stuff's always been really good. So but what, there has what been. What is Bolter Porn? It when it's just Space Marines going back and back and back and back and back and back and back and, back and, and there isn't any real other substance to it. Some of the Horace Heresy books are truly despicable for it. Yeah, because I is. know eventually I'll have to read some of them, and I'm just going to want to. Oh, I'll, uh, if, if you want to read this, we'll keep you going for the next 20 years. I'll happily give you that. <laughs> Granted, some of them will be crazy books that are out of print. But, uh, you know. well, luckily, with Arbiter Ian's channel, people mm-hmm. vote. So hopefully yeah. the Daka 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 Volta Porn ones won't prevail. Mm-hmm. But sorry, I stopped you in the middle of your point there. That's all right. Uh, did, I, I, did I have a point? I <laughs> oh, no. I'm rambling on. Um, have you served? Yeah, so the, the level up happened. Um, and what it did was it not only invited a different type of writer in, but it also gave you a different type of story. So the, the really good way of describing this is the first books with Age of Sigma to the books that came out in the third year of Age of Sigma. Right? The first books of Age of Sigma are very much fantastical ideas, and here are the Stormcast who are going to hit things until they go away. Right? Mm. Then you get City of Secrets, which is a story about a witch hunter and an ex-guardsman on a city that's built on a spear of prophecy, where prophecy is used as a currency and a drug. Ooh. Right? Yeah. So we're into some really interesting metaphysics here to start with. This is like, mm, this is this is my bread and butter. Mm, feed it to me now. Mm, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> um, and so you've got people who are on the streets, jonesing for a little slice of prophecy. Oh, Lord. And, you know, they, they, need, they need that little bit of prophecy, but they also need some prophecy to be able to buy some other stuff as well. Yeah, you know, it's, I tell it's you a what, really interesting idea. As somebody who can't watch a movie without looking it up on Wikipedia, I would be fucked in that society. <laughs> but it sounds brilliant. I, I, yeah, I, I do love talking about books with you. That's, uh, that, it do- yeah, adds that's... to my re- reading list every time, but... <laughs> I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm actually a member of six different libraries from Basingstoke to Chelsea and Westminster to Dorset, just so I can read as many books as possible for free. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got a, um, a couple of accounts with um, Abe, uh, Abe Books. And so it's always go on there, type in a couple of keywords and then like uh, lowest price and see what you can get. That's a great you just end up with like, Oh yeah, what, what's this? It's a 1940s um, Tom Swift book. I will have me a few of those. Thank you very much. Love it, love it. Love Tom Swift. <sighs> the world would be a better place if more people loved reading. I mean, I'd say the majority of people that I that I enjoy speaking to all have share a love of reading or a, a love of uh, you know fictional escapism. You know, whether it is through reading, through games, through um, through movies or whatnot. You know. That ability to share that passion and talk about it with with other people, I think that's it, it's just good, isn't it? It's just fun. It really, is. yeah. Talk about the adventures that you have whilst I don't know, hallucinating, staring at a piece of dead tree. It's just a wonderful thing to do. <laughs> yeah, that's the Monday night for us, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, where was that? Yeah, right. So the leveling up. So what you had then was the city secrets, um, and. The ramping up started there, and then you get something like uh, Dark Harvest, which I will very, very happily plant my flag in the ground and say, there is one you need for the book club. Did because you say Dark, 
Dark Elvis. No, Dark Harvest. Dark Elvis is an entirely different book. Um, <laughs> it's set during the um, the Dark Future, uh, now discontinued, motorway a fighting game, the games which I did in the late 80s. Um, you think I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you and I are going to write a book called Dark Elvis together. Oh, you see, uh, what, what's happening now is that uh, here at Las Vegas, the uh, <laughs> King Elvis has died, and Buddy Holly has to come and take his crown. Has he died, or is he sucking the souls of a million and one <laughs> country singers? Well, this is getting into Bubba Hotep now. <laughs> <laughs> Bless the mass soul. Dark Harvest. <laughs> drawn, tell me, tell uh, me. Dark Harvest. Dark Harvest. It's um, a bit of a mystery, and it's, it's an annoying one because it, whilst the book wraps itself up and it is done, I desperately want to see more from the characters that are in that book in this horrible, damp, one plant that this guy finds himself in trying to work out the mystery of what's going on. Don't you as, hate that when there's a character you absolutely love and you can't revisit? Oh, I feel so, a, so lucky. One of my favourite literary characters is Philip Marlowe. Mm -hmm. We have stories around him. But for you found the characters that you were like, oh, the you know, the world, the characters, and will you be able to turn again or is that it, just one? Well, there hasn't been anything since. But it's a, a bit of a shame. And from what I understand, the author, that might have actually been his last Black Library book as well. So it's a bit of a weird one. It's a weird one, Black Library, because in a way, it's like, you know, if Hasbro were like, we need a He Man and Man at Arms book. You know, mm -hmm. it's authors who may not necessarily be in it because they love writing about those characters or the setting because the Black mm -hmm. Library needs a book. And then yeah, when yeah. you have those Dan Abnets and you do get a series, that's jackpot. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you get Dave Ascension by, uh, and I always get his name wrong and I feel so bad about it. So I'll just call him Adrian. Um, <laughs> I'm going to Google it while you talk. Go on. I'm going to Tchaikovsky, Tchaikovsky, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, okay. Dave Ascension is an absolute stunner of a book. So in reading that, in reading um, uh, Gothic Old Hollow, it's actually got me for the first time ever to actually start writing book reviews. Never done it before. But because these two books in quick succession have absolutely blown my mind, I had to start writing this. Sorry, where do you publish huh? your reviews? Well, you know, it's, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but yeah, it's all at the www.thefluffandhammer.com. Perfect. I'll tell you, <laughs> the Adrian Tchaikovsky books that I've read, Children of mm -hmm. Time, yes. Empire in Black and Gold, mm -hmm. Shards of Earth, Dragon I haven't read that one. Dragonfly Falling, Cage of Souls. Mm. I'll give The Tiger and the Wolf. I'll give any of his books a whirl. Some I like more than others. Mm. What a mind. Oh, yeah. I need to get onto Cage of Souls, actually. I've got it sitting there and I haven't started it yet. Shall we see what I said about Cage of Souls? <laughs> You'll find out what a prick I am when I write reviews. <laughs> okay, ready? A, a blind donkey could write better. <laughs> <laughs> Cage of Souls. My rating. Five stars. So mm -hmm. many ideas in one book. A brutal read, but completely <laughs> compelling and wonderfully woven together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I fucking oh. love books. I love reviewing. I'm so mm -hmm. excited that we're friends now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've actually, in all this, and I'm sure part of it's your fault as well, by the way. Um, <laughs> Deny. Because it wasn't long after we, we talked originally uh, that I started writing this stuff out. Uh, and it's like, oh, okay, I actually really enjoy this. This is a whole new way of writing I've never done before. So I'm going to continue doing this. I, I love anything that allows you to really show your heart and say, oh, I love this bit of it. And then mm -hmm. when you're creating stuff, and you, you, something gave you a tingle and you're like, oh, how can I make my character have these qualities that made me love that character? Mm -hmm. And also... You and I know, as writers and creators, how scary and terrifying that is and how beautiful it is when someone can express a connection. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I mean, one of the, the highlights of the last couple of months, anyhow, was after writing a review for Gothic Old Hollow, the author not only retweeted it, but also said a very nice thank you. And I'm sitting there going, Yay. Oh, okay, didn't expect that. I'm a little bit scared now. How did you react? Did you just... Nodding. Well, I got into my big hamster wheel for half an hour and just ran on that until the uh, nervous energy burnt out. I uh, just 
we have at the back and forth, just saying thank you. Reading that has made me want to start writing these reviews. Amazing. And she, she said very nice things. So I was like, this is the nicest day of work. Yeah. Very happy. There's um, but, there's an author mm-hmm. called Mark Lawrence, and he's written. Mm-hmm. He writes great, uh, kind of like magic sci-fi, kind of post-apocalyptic stuff, and he mm-hmm. is very, very all over Goodreads. Mm-hmm. Um, so he reviews other books and I think that's fascinating when an author you really like reviews for example he reviewed a Robin Hobb and I love Robin Hobb and he reviewed mm-hmm. Small and Pierce and it's just like wow yeah that's really cool mm-hmm. love it really really cool I'm so happy you started <laughs> oh. reviewing because if I follow your reviews and I know you like something that opens up an opportunity for me to discover that book also mm-hmm um, what I really enjoy doing is limiting myself by not giving away plot points, spoilers, but just getting into the themes and the feels of the book. Mm-hmm. And that, that's a really interesting way because I, I'm not giving, I don't want to give away spoilers. And I don't want to give away storylines. I don't want to give away how my brain has interpreted the information that's in the book and put it out there. I, I've never done that before. And it's a really fascinating experiment. Themes so, and yeah. feelings. I love that. Theme. Mm-hmm. Oh, we have to. Yeah have to if, before we stop talking about book I, i'm sure i would have wailed on you about this last time because i'm obsessed but the expanse yes yeah i haven't actually read the expanse yet please i beg you i'm <laughs> even like to gift you on abe's books or something but absolutely just it, it's two authors who write as james s a cory mm-hmm. um and it's like it's not like hard sci-fi, but it's so beautiful. The worlds are fantastic. You have, yeah, you have belters who have grown up and living on space stations. You have earthers and Martians. And mm-hmm. there's a little bit of like a bleak alien civilization kind of what the fuck are we going on? And detective and noir. It's chef's kiss. Well, in that case, then I shall also throw back at you the Bobbyverse. The Bobbyverse? Mm-hmm. We are Legion, we are Bob a book that I picked up on Audible because I quite like the title. I thought, yeah, I'm in the mood for something lighthearted. This looks like it could be fun. By Dennis E. Um, Taylor. Got it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's a series that starts off with a guy uh, being, so on his death, he is cryogenically frozen, um, whilst also at a uh, San Diego Comic-Con. You go through the Comic-Con with him, and then he's run over and dies, and then you get him waking up. And I'm not going to get into... Anything else about it here? I have a love of von Neumann probes. They are a fascinating idea and a fascinating concept. So a book that then involves a AI and a sentient von Neumann probe is making me sing and dance and happy, <laughs> happy, happy, whilst also being a better Ready Player One. Because let's face it, Ready Player One is knackers. Oh. Uh, <laughs> It's not a book. It's a collection. No, I'm not going to start ranting on Ready Player One. I've done that enough times in my listen, life. Listen, Ready Player One mentions Will Wheaton, who is my favourite go-to teen hunk since I was 11. Mm-hmm. And yes, it is just a love letter to pop culture from my childhood. But no one else had collated it, and it was a romp. It was a light-hearted romp. Mm. The movie I thought was Bobbins. But I didn't, I, I, I didn't finish the film. Couldn't, couldn't finish it. I, it was I, just noise. The film was bad, but my friend Kim took me to a screening. And at the mm-hmm. screening, they had the um, Back to the Future car outside. And when we Ooh. went in, my friend Kim, who writes for fandom and has written books on The Matrix that have been published, she's shown Keanu Reeves. Mm-hmm. And she regularly, oh, that's interviews, cool. she regularly interviews like Bill Murray, you know, The Rock, whoever. She's writing a book on Die Hard. She said, Mira, sometimes we get, you know, there'll be a director or a producer or someone will come and introduce the movie. And only bloody Steven Spielberg introduced the movie. Okay, that's cool. That's very cool. Because I'm from Reading and I'm a very sad individual, I went, go on, Steven! And uh, (laughs) immediately regretted it. But, you know, it got a bit of a cringy, like, ha, 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 and a clap in the cinema. And that Mm. was the best bit of the film. Adam, that's that's amazing. The rest of the film the, was like, oh, CG, mm-hmm. hell. Yeah, it was a, 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 yeah. Well, you have reminded me of going to see. This makes me sound like a real tricky. I'm not in any way, shape, or form. You, you should going be. to see Star Trek Three. No, I don't. I don't dislike Star Trek at all. I think 
Um, I think the original series is great. I think Next Generation is great. I think Deep Space Nine is a pinnacle of TV creation. It goes downhill after that, but that's by the by. But uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the cinema. Uh, I was in Reading for a week and watching oh, yeah. Star Trek Three, The Wrath of Khan, and when uh, Picard, not Picard, when Kirk did the entire Khan thing, three rows of people in Star Trek uniforms stood up and shouted it with him, and then all sat back down. Oh! And it is... <laughs> It was like an absolute fever dream. It was one of the weirdest <laughs> moments of my life. Just... Oh, I love Reading. I mean, I left as quickly as I could as soon as I turned 17, mm. but fucking love Reading. This would be 99, 2000, maybe. Yeah, I started at uni in London in 97, 98, I think. Mm -hmm. So I missed that. I'd have loved to see that. Very weird experience. <laughs> Star, Tre Star Trek fans make the world a better place, period. <laughs> Well, I mean, as long as everyone agrees that First Contact or Die Hard in Space is the best Star Trek film, we're all good. Um, <laughs> no more. The line must be drawn here. This far, no further. And I will make them pay. Oh, love love that. that film. Um, so I did actually have about 20 minutes ago, maybe half an hour ago, a really good segue to get into the next bit that I wanted to get into. <laughs> do it. Do the segue. But not only did we Thelma and Louise off the side of a cliff and get as far away from it as we could. Um, that's, not, we, uh, that's not the intention. That may be what happened. Oh, no, no, no. We entered a different conversation. We entered a canyon of words Back that uh, went a very different direction. <laughs> well, as long as I get to have the, uh, the headscarf, I'm fine. Um, <laughs> we've got to sit and have to make up with Brad Pitt. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, <laughs> we were talking originally about how 2018 kind of introduced you to the Grimdark. So what I was actually going to say to you was, what was your journey in like? I mean, what are the, the points that have really jumped out at you and made you go, I like that, I like that, I like that, I like that? I don't like a lot about the Grimdark. One mm -hmm. of the things that it's made me appreciate is 2022 is still not as bad as the Grimdark. We're getting close. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I always joke that if I was born into this universe, I would quite like to just be on an out of the way desert island planet. And yes, I'd be subjugated mm. and a slave, but could I go and have some beach time and drink from a coconut? Because it all <laughs> seems so horrific. And there are very, there aren't moments of small kindnesses or beauty or joy or silliness. So I think things like when we got to read, um, and Cassius Kane, mm -hmm. you know, that for me was like... Oh, the, uh, yeah, Typhus, Typhus Kane. Typhus, yeah, I'm thinking of Cassius Clay, the boxer, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Easy mistake, but... Um, there, there's a, an amalgamation that I really want to see. Yeah. Look like a butterfly, sting like a stormhawk jet. Yeah. <laughs> it's as if we rehearsed that bit. You're so quick with these. <laughs> I, I do like a bit... I like the fact that it's self-knowing and ironic. I think it's problematic mm. that a lot of people don't realise it's self-knowing and ironic and like to keep it fairly right-wing. I, I feel the beauty in the shadows and the darkness and the people that I meet who are completely in love with it and entranced by it are some of the most creative and artistic individuals that I know. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the grimdark is about resilience and finding you know, some kind of peace in those cracks, you know, in yeah. the darkness. But I find it very <laughs> uncomfortable and disquieting and I don't like staying there too long. So I love when I get to edit artists doing walkthroughs and things, mm -hmm. and, you know, waxing lyrical about the artwork or even like how to set up your cameras. And um, yeah, I mean, I appreciate it for what it is, but I wouldn't want to live there. Oh, no, nobody wants to live there. I mean, 40K starts its life as satire in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the great old warlord, guys called Mac Ulrich Tracker, is an anagram of Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. You know, it's these are things that are there on purpose. Uh, I actually find it really funny when you hear about uh, uh, extreme right wingists who are taking 40Ks for their own, when the reality was 40K was written by the most left-wing people you will ever come across in your entire life. They are all extremely left-wing university people. And yeah. it's, it, it baffles my brain because people don't see the satire. Space Marines are not good. They are ubermensch. Yeah. Yeah, they are terrifying. They are bad. 
What in a lot you, of ways. What do you love most about the Green Dark? Uh, before you get it, um, I think it's the scale. I think the ridiculous scale. There's a wonderful thing in Dark Imperium, right? Um, and it's the realization that nobody knows what year it actually is. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's impossible. You can't know what year it is because pe- the way that the travel through the warp works, you get time dilation, mm. uh, going from planet to planet to planet to planet. It, you could skip forward three years, go back another two, skip forward another five. Nobody knows what year you're actually in on a galactic scale. And that is brilliant. Um, the, the families of people who are born to Q. Yeah, that it, it's so ridiculous. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of that. You know, nobody mm-hmm. knows a lot of things. Is the emperor alive or dead? Is one of the discussions. Mm-hmm. But um, I think that he's actually a sock puppet. Yep, yeah, I'm going with you for that. But I, what I, do, <laughs> what I do really love is as I go through books and I discover the different Xeno, Xenos races. Mm-hmm. I think I've spoken to you about this before. I learned about Titans through one yeah. of the um, the Inquisitor book. And I'm mm-hmm. obsessed because I've seen some really cool black and neon Titan minis online that I want to play my first Warhammer tournament with a Necron and a bunch of squats or something. But I really love my friends that I've made in the hobby and the stories that I get to read. Um, but when you ask me about the Grim Dark and I think about living there or being part of it, I'm completely horrified. How long do you, well, think, uh, how long do you think I'd last in the Grim Dark if I was born in? Well, it, it depends where you were born. Um, I can imagine you surviving quite well on Necromunda. You know, I can I can see that as what, some what kind of like. What would life be uh, like for me on Necromunda? Could you run me through a day in my life? Well, I, I think you'd probably do all right. You'd probably be some kind of librarians with the uh, the Escher can. So you'd end up like both being the storyteller and the um, the writer of poisons. Okay, yeah, so yeah. somewhere in between there. Yeah. Would I have um, like a, an extra monocle eye implant or anything like that? I mean, you could if you wanted to. If you wanted to, you'd have three monocles. It's entirely up to you. I am not the judge of your monocle and usage. <laughs> Thank you for, for being a non-judgmental monocle man. <laughs> I, I never judge. Never judge. You can have as many glass eyes as you physically can fit in your pocket. Thank you. Fine by me. What happens if um, you're shit at fighting and you're born into this? Uh, you could always be a Grox farmer. You could always uh, be like a, a meat stirrer. You know, one of the people who's, uh, you know, you the big vats of reprocessed meat and they need someone to... One of the cool things about 40K, and this is something that... Um, I don't know if you, you saw... Um, oh, the film about the, the train, the last train on, on Earth as everything's entering a winter apocalypse. The ice train, and it goes round and around and keeps yeah. you alive. Okay. Snow. Snow. Snow piercer. Snow piercer. There you go. So there's the thing in Snowpiercer. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's, it's years old now. Uh, about the parts going extinct, and you have to like get the children into there to try and like have to move all the parts and things. Um, which is it's a very grim dark film. Oh my very god, that stresses me out. Um, even thinking about that. Oh, it's it's quite horrible. Uh, but that's in a lot of ways that's what 40k has. Nobody knows how a lot of the machines work. Right, this is it's a yes. really cool thing. Nobody quite understands. It's why you have that ritual that goes with it. AI, the abominable intelligence, is outlawed and seen as being this dark and horrible thing, and yet everybody worships the machine spirits within the the tanks and all these other things, which are obviously AI because they don't know how it works and they've forgotten all about all of it. Yeah, yeah, so it's all been replaced with ritual and religion. And that's amazing to me. That's such a cool... It's very human in my eyes. Yes. Yeah, we forget how something works, and so we make it into a thing of mythology. We make it into a thing of ritual and, as I say, ritual and religion. And so you can see that throughout our history. You look at the... Uh, when the Romans left, um, and you've got these statues kicking around uh, various parts of Londinium, and these people are like creating these strange little mythologies and cults around them and leaving fruit and things there, you know, 50 years later, which at that time is two generations. But all it is, is like some rich guy had some statues outside his house. Mm. You know, it's, it's weird, weird stuff. It really is. Yeah, you know, the, the Sycamore after the Romans have left in their, 
you know, they're burning everything to the ground because they don't want to have these false religions staring at them. But the reality is that they're just murals on the wall of uh, Cyprus or somewhere like that, you know. It's very funny. Mark Lawrence, the books that I mentioned, build his world on top of so computer tech will turn up and they won't have any idea what it is mm. and just smash the shit out of it yeah i mean i <laughs> i do love i love the psychic the blank elements of and i mean i i love to see that played out I, you know i'd love to see that played out on the tabletop how that works if you have psychers and the damage they can do and bloody mm. bloody blah one of the things i did enjoy very very much was my friend ian who had, who opened up so many gateways to so many um, nerd, nerdy hobbies for me, introduced me to the Eisenhorn books. Mm -hmm. So we read those. And oh, yes. One of the things that I love is that Dan Abnett takes Eisenhorn to many different planets mm -hmm. and you get to experience those different cultures. And there was this one, one of the Eisenhorn books, they go to a nightclub where they're playing pound music. Mm -hmm. and in my mind, it is just this shop called Cyberdog in London in Camden. Which is yep, I know Cyberdog. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I love that aspect of it that you can have these real, weird and wonderful alien worlds with their own civilizations. Mm -hmm. um, that appeals to me. Like you're saying, the depth and breadth of the universe. I think, I think the size of it, the size and scale, is fascinating. But when you can kind of really focus in on one tiny minuscule area, for example, a city on a planet, you get to see a lot of really interesting things. There's a book called, one second, let me just grab my, thing. of course, the first thing that pops up there is service games. That's not what I'm after. Uh, no, that's Red Dwarf. What are you doing? <laughs> Why is this not working for me? Oh, I love technology. It's a wonderful thing. I'm so glad that it works. Uh, where's it gone? Where's it gone? I'm really pushing for time in as many different ways as I can. Allow me to sing a song. I'm going <laughs> to ask the question on the 28th Twitter, what do you love most about the Grim Dark? I bet we get some really brilliant answers. I think they'll give very cool answers come out of that. Watcher in the Rain, that's not it. Where are you gone? It's part of the Warhammer Crime series, anyhow. Um, Warhammer Crime series? Mm -hmm. Why yeah, well, do, do I not you not know about this? Warhammer Crime? So Warhammer Crime is uh, all set on the this one planet, and it allows you to really explore a lot of what living in the 41st millennium is like, um, which is really quite cool. Living in the 40th Something millennium. <laughs> Living in Imperium. Yes, there we go. Living in Imperium. <laughs> we go, we're going to have an album at the end of this. <laughs> We've got a lot of projects on the go, haven't we? Oh, welcome to the inside of my head, which is always 33 projects at any given go. It must have been. I'm just going to message lines. Ian yeah. saying, why did you not tell me there's a Warhammer Crime series? <laughs> Uh, without giving anything away, Bloodlines is a story about a detective. Um, not a detective, he's got a different name, but he is a, he's a PI for all intents and purposes, um, who is investigating the kidnapping and murder of young um, hive dwellers, right? Which is all really well and good. And then about halfway through the book, it turns around and you realise that the person that you've been following this entire time, you think is a good guy, oh, he's you're still a good guy. Oh, you now. Oh, no, no, I've, I've spoken nothing. He's a good guy, but the system in which he lives changes the reality in which you see him, and it is. Okay, it what's, is, what's that book called? I'm sure, I'm sure it's Bloodlines, but I'm struggling to find it on my list. Um, you need to get a good reads account so I can follow you. Okay, I shall have a go at that and uh, try to remember to actually do things. And uh, now that's Slash of the Titans. It's a very different book. Did you ever read any of the Dragons of Kern books? Yes. Did you love them? I seem to remember loving them. Um, it probably has been at least 22, three years since I last read them, but I remember thoroughly enjoying them at the time. I love it's them. one of those ones where I really should go back and reread them just to refresh the memory. I've already got fragments of it. Yeah. Bloody hell. I wish I could write like these 
characters that I love. Mm-hmm. So, yes, so do I. <laughs> so, um, so okay, we've got another yet another book recommendation. I will pass on to Ian. So, I'll, I'll double check to make sure it's the right one. As, uh, I don't want to just be spending the next twenty minutes scrolling through my list of books, which is like seventeen pages long. Um, just to let you know quickly, I looked up the book "We Are Legion, We Are Bob," and it's mm-hmm. really hard to get hold of for less than a tenner now because I quite like really? physical, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I can't find it in the libraries, but. Ooh. So, if there was a type of book that you'd like to see, and I've got a feeling that we might have answered that by now that you have now found out that there is Warhammer crime. Um, what would you like to see? Would it be like a Philip Marlowe in the 41st Millennium, or would you like more something like a, uh, I don't know, Peter Falk's Columbo in the 41st Millennium, or even, I mean, don't get me wrong, that would be amazing. Just one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big Columbo fan. I mean, a murder she wrote in would be a great, wouldn't it? Jessica Fletcher type character turning up. Yes, Inquisitor Jessica Fletcher. Granny, oh, an Inquisitor's granny turns up on vacation and happens to solve a mystery. What I, I absolutely love origin stories. Mm-hmm. Like they're my bread and butter. When I watched Spider Man and his amazing friends, my favorite episode of that cartoon was when we found out how Firestar got her powers. Yep. And the X Men book where you find that out too. But I would really love, it probably exists, the origin story of the Golden Emperor in very simple terms. This is exactly what happened and how the Imperium came about. I would love a distant past, modern day seeding mm. of how it could eventually emerge millennia later. And well, I would love um, he's, in, he's in Turkey at the moment. <laughs> is he? That's where he is. Yep. And in the early parts of the. Uh... Yes, yeah, the two thousands. Yeah, he's in uh, he's in Turkey somewhere. Good to know. But I mean, I I'd love to. I love defining origin books. Mm-hmm. I think you know, in the case of the emperor, you'll never see a defining origin. Be- well, to be honest with you, I think that by the time the uh, the siege of terror comes to an end, what's going to be on the throne? It isn't going to be the thing that we think it is. Uh, would be my guess. I don't think that that's what the emperor used to be is his body now that, that i swear i actually do speak english that wasn't english in the slightest that was just a collection of random guttural syllables uh, okay. i might as well just have started <laughs> I, picked um, up, I picked up what you were putting down <laughs> well, what i was putting down was the emperor's corpse get down there um <laughs> i firmly believe that when that book ends that final siege of terror book ends whatever we see on the on the golden throne isn't the emperor that we think it is why why do you think that no worries <laughs> big heavy bottle of water down it's um, not water it's ribena we're both drinking ribena it, it is ribena don't yes. try and sound cooler than me you, you i am considerably cooler than you <laughs> i am considerably cooler than you because <laughs> i am a servitor <laughs> I didn't know Michael Caine's getting all these gigs now. <laughs> okay, reason, okay, reasons. Okay. So, uh, Malik uh he, I would put down a thirty-pound bet, thirty-two pounds fifty bet, that the Emperor on the Golden Throne is actually uh, Malkador, the um, the Emperor's regent, the second in command. Oh, the I old think, switcheroo. Mm-hmm. And I think either the Emperor dies at the Hand of Horus, like dead, dead, and it's Malkador that's on the Golden Throne, or the Emperor's still around somewhere. Interesting. That would be mm-hmm. very cool if it was a bit like the Foundation, where Harry Seddon set up the first Foundation mm-hmm. with the fake regent. But yep. there was a second foundation, which was the actual emperor, and he was not mm-hmm. happy. Came back and <laughs> oh, sorry, I just sneezed in That's excitement. <laughs> I got an allergy to boredom. No, no, that was. <laughs> I love that idea. I love that. That that is my. I, I mean, you've got Dan Abnett, um, Dembski Bowden, and a few others in there. So whatever they do, it's going to be the thing that I've never thought of because that's what they do. Uh, that's what they've always done. 
Yeah. But that would be my guess. That is my gut feeling that at the very end, the Emperor is either pulverized and they need something to go on the Golden Throne to keep the Imperium alive, or Malkador is the one that gets wrecked and then he gets installed in the Golden Throne and the Emperor is bugged off somewhere. I, I would like that to happen, I think. I think it would change a lot of what we see the Imperium as. I think that'd be really, really quite interesting. Very cool. But then again, I also quite like the idea that the uh, the Emperor's only alive on the Golden Throne is because the Orcs believe he can't die. The belief system. Mm -hmm. The like, Orc belief system is a thing of beauty. So, like, when you... Every time you say you don't believe in fairies, they disappear. So the Orcs have to mm -hmm. believe in the Emperor. Oh, no. Do you know about the Orc belief system? I don't. You're going to have to educate okay. me. Well, you see, red ones go faster. So you've got to pick your bookies red in order to make them go faster. And they go faster. Right? The Imperium have a tendency of looking wow. at all weapons and going, I don't understand. There's no place for ammunition to go. Yet it shoots bullets. What, what is happening with this? The orc belief system is so strong. The power of the world is so strong that it changes reality. That's insane. It, is that true? It's never been come out and said that that's the case. But there's enough hints there for you to be able to kind of make that coalition, okay. you know, that uh, correlation, sorry. Um, I think a lot of the times people don't say, well, it doesn't really work like that. It's not that strong. But there's enough there for you to go, actually, if there's enough orcs kicking around, yes, that happens. That's there's a thing that they used to have called the shock attack gun. Right? Yeah. And the shock attack gun, um, it blew a hole in reality for snotlings to jump into, and they would then travel through the warp in a little tunnel and then come out the other end, right? The other end could be outside a house, inside a tank, inside power armor, right? Doesn't really matter. They'll just appear somewhere. And they're all terrified because demons are all around the tunnel going, bah, 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 bah. that's not possible with the tech that exists in 40, in the Warhammer 40,000. You can't make a portable warp generator. People have tried, and it doesn't work. But yet the orcs did it. I'm so excited. Not the orcs are the best. Yes, you are an orc fan, aren't you? Oh yes, I love the orcs. <laughs> we are the best. <laughs> well, I'm. I've learned something new tonight. See, this is why it's so great for me to wander around, not knowing a lot. Because when you get amazing people such as yourself <laughs> teaching me, you get to learn all the fun stuff. <laughs> I, well, next week we'll learn all about the gene stealers of Epositor, which is a horrible word, but I always like saying it. <laughs> well, I look forward to more conversations with you, <laughs> I think, because it's always such a pleasure. I'm so sad that the last one is lost to the chaos of the warp, but we had oh, well, I think if we tuned George's ears in, we could probably hear it again. It's just like echoed and distorted, but it'd still be there. It's out there somewhere. So jealous. Very much so. I'm so <coughs> for I'm listener, sorry. listeners, I'm very jealous of Adam, who's basically drinking out of a huge bottle of Ribena, the type of which you normally see atop a water cooler. It's that big. <laughs> it's bigger than his torso. So uh, it's, I have to get that. Uh, I have to get all of this down me every evening. <laughs> That's also, the, uh, the, the healthy water. Big old biceps. <laughs> Because the weight of that water container... That's, that's the other good thing about it, is it's, uh, it's really good weightlifting. So. <laughs> Yay, but I'm sure there's loads we were meant to talk about and we haven't. Well, don't worry, because we're going to get to that right now. Because 28 is not the only thing that you do. <laughs> oh, get that for a segue. <laughs> but I know that you also play a lot of uh, RPGs and you uh, do a lot of stuff in your local area playing RPGs. But I also know about some other things that you do that's RPG-related. The floor is yours. So I'm part of an organisation, a charity called No More Damsels, that is all about creating opportunities to make wargaming and RPG games more gender diverse. So, mm -hmm. you know, one of our taglines is, have you ever been to a gaming or hobby centre and thought, hmm, there are not a lot of people here who look like me? Um, yeah, and we're trying to change that. And um, there are a few of us and we try and do things like create events, um, where all the GMs are 
not necessarily going to be guys and you'll get to kind of mm -hmm. be around people that represent your gender and we try and create safe spaces and share tools such as X cards to keep um, gaming arenas safe. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one Absolutely. of my real beloved charities. I've been involved with them for about three or four years, set mm -hmm. up by the amazing Sarah Pipkin and Naomi Clark. Naomi is also the writer of a fantastic horror um, uh, audio series podcast called The Secret of St. Kilda, which I urge anybody to listen to. It's really, really compelling. It was released weekly, which killed me, but it's epic. Um, I'm also part of The Hate Club, which is an acronym for the Hackney Area Tabletop Enthusiasts, where they do lots of wargaming, um, Historical, Warhammer, Sigma, Blood Bowl, Frostgrave, you name it, they play it there. Um, and I used to be a every Saturday member of the London D&D Meetup, um, mm -hmm. which sadly I haven't been able to go to for a while, but I'm really looking forward to, dungeon, to being a dungeon master there again in summer. Mm -hmm. And, 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 I occasionally write for Dragon Plus and D&D Beyond. That's really cool. I write for a fantastic independent gaming mag called Weird Science that featured Mork. What's that game called? Morkborg. Morkborg. Yes. And yeah. It's amazing. Mm. Um, Love Morkborg. It's spelled W Y R D Science. And if you could give that a follow on social, that'd be amazing because the guy that runs it, John Power, is a one man machine. And again, you know, mm -hmm. you find these great people just sacrificing their lives and their money for the love of the game. Oh yeah, yeah. And I am pretty much all over online as Mira Manga, and I really like followers, and I like retweeting and reposting <laughs> fun stuff, and I like to feel I have some friends on the internet. So I've got any friends in real life. <laughs> but that's me in a nutshell. And my main mission in life, my main life motto is: life is suffering. All our job is, is to look after each other and make the ride and the journey a little bit more enjoyable and look after each other and love each other. That's very Bill Hicks of you. Oh, I like Bill Hicks. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill Hicks's motto in life was that, uh, um, how did it go? The ride will always be dark, dark, dark. But we're always together to make it ride, ride, ride. And it's, I've always been a big fan of that idea. You know, that no matter how far and how low and how bleak things get, we are, as a species, very much uh, in tuned into connecting with each other. Yeah. And the more people there are, the more light we can carry. You and I very much share these philosophies where we're both extremely sensitive to the plight of, of people and we both suffer ourselves. But I think we get a lot of... Um, relief and calmness in being able to be kind and receive kindness? Well, kindness costs you nothing. No, that, no, I live a, don't, a very, no, don't minimise um, it, because kindness yeah. is also a really loving, vulnerable gesture to give. Yeah, true, true. So, I live for um, some very simple mottos in life. Uh, everybody is worthy of respect until they prove themselves otherwise, being a very, very important one. Um, also, uh, it's better to curse the darkness than it is to light the flamethrower. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Bradget. I mean, God, wouldn't it be awful if you and I had flamethrowers? I think that'd be the worst idea ever. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean, if? Uh-oh. On the other hand, I also uh, pray for the meteorite strike to take us all back to the Stone Age so we can begin again. But, you know, that's, that's just my own personal wow. feeling. You know. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I'd last about as long in the Stone Age as, yeah, I would not last very long in the Stone Age. I don't know, I'm fairly sure you could probably get some kind of telekinetic link with a dinosaur, and that'd be fine. Yeah, I could ride a cute little dinosaur. An I can see you as an Ankylosaurus. Ankylosaurus? Mm -hmm. I thought that was a punchline to that joke, but do you think, do you think he saw us? <laughs> What's my favourite dinosaur? The one that eats grass? And is quite low to the ground and stout. That one, that's my favourite dinosaur. <laughs> and there's many of them that are like that. Um, I'll, tweet, I'll tweet it. 
I don't even listen to the Atuitasaurus. <laughs> Which, if, if you said that was a real thing, I'd believe you. I'd believe you. <laughs> oh. Um, so to, to end things up, I've got a, uh, a little question for you. Right? Um, I'm just aware that uh, time is getting on a bit. Um, uh, something that I was going to bring up last time but never did, so I'm kind of glad that we got around to this version. What is it about RPGs and DMing in particular that you would say is the, the best thing, the most powerful thing, the, the thing that always draws you into it? Oh, well... The thing that draws me into it is I never really grew out of hoping that there was magic or that we mm -hmm. would be living on planets in different solar systems and thriving. And as a real life example, like I came back hard to D and D after one of the worst breakups of my life, where I met the guy mm -hmm. in my teenage years, we reunited when I was older, fallen in love, and I thought, wow, this is it, mortgage, life, love the end he wasn't so convinced so i just immersed myself in D, D and being able to take part in or weave these stories and where and this is one of the most important things to me where you and five or six of your friends work together not as hobo murderers not as one of you fucking off and looting but you work together and the dm creates opportunities for you to work as various golden threads in a beautiful tapestry to create stories, fulfill your characters, strengthen your friendships, eat some tasty pub snacks, be able <laughs> to be social without needing to drink alcohol. It's just everything and it opens my heart to be able to share stories and fun and creativity <clears throat> with friends. And it always reminds me of my dad because my dad was the one that turned me on to fantasy and sci-fi novels. And I think if my dad saw my life now, he would be so stoked for me and the books that we'd be passing to each other, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think Dungeons and Dragons and the very simple fact of playing a game with friends where you make stuff up is oh, yeah. pure and beautiful and it just takes me away from reality, which can be, like I say, you know, life can be suffering at times. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm quite a happy person, but when I'm sad, you know, D&D &D is five three or four blessed hours without anxiety or craving or grief that can yeah. really do that for me. So those are my favourite things about RPG. I, uh, I firmly believe that we could use um, for maybe not just D&D &D, but various forms of RPGs as uh, therapy in a lot of ways yes. because it, it does a lot of the things that you say. It allows you to get distance between uh, very real psychological things that happen to you and be able to see them from that distance because you're inhabiting a different person for that, that period of time. And it's, I, I do kind of wish that somebody would give me a couple of thousand, 15,000 pounds in order to research this by playing a lot of D&D uh, &D with people. Um, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure, Adam, you will have noticed about four or five years ago, there was like a real spate of articles about D and D being played in prisons in the US, yeah. And you know those articles were all very favourable that it really helped with the mental health of prisoners, and it was engaging. And the controversy was that people were not allowing that the prisons were banning. You know they couldn't have dice. You know particularly in higher security places, but it's got it's got to have been proven. There's got to have been research on it. I, I, well, I found you believe it. I know that um, in the early 2000s, astronauts were playing D&D &D because it's non-competitive. So you're in a spaceship and you're playing chess. You, that could go horribly wrong when somebody keeps winning. Yes. Because RPGs are non-competitive, they were being used in shuttle flights and stuff as ways of passing the time. I mean, I mean that is, it is, it's supposed to be a collaborative game. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, because of min maxes and always those people who want to be the rogues and the chaos wizards, chaos warlocks, sorry, mm -hmm. messing it up. But it's my dream. That's why I like DMing for kids quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Because you can say to them, you, you are a cleric, you help your friends. And they kind of, you know, I guess there's a little bit of me school marming them. But collaboration is so beautiful when people work together. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
And when you've got a lot of people who are working together to create the story that's being presented to them, because I mean, as a DM, you're only telling part of the story. You're telling the events that are happening in the environment. The players tell the story of the characters. And that's the way it gets really interesting. When they're all working together to create that narrative, you get something so wonderful and so, a lot of times, silly and daft, but also even quite powerful. And, yeah. You know, it's, well, you know, um, the the Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman Dragonlance mm-hmm. novels yes. were written around their tabletop yeah. sessions and Raceland, who's mm. like such an anti-hero, he came fully formed because the player playing him decided to give him a really whispering, sinister voice, and that character yes. came to life. And yeah, so I mean, I mean, I, there's it makes so you've much never sense. really truly trusted me, dear brother. Oh yeah, and you shouldn't have Cameron because he's an arsehole. But um, oh, absolutely, yeah. I think. It's no wonder that so many of us who fall in love with the game would do anything to stay in it, create our own, write our own, run games, mm-hmm. join clubs, try and get jobs in the industry because it's just a beautiful place. I mean, you know, D&D films, no matter how bad they are, we will watch them. Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, <laughs> we both have. Although, to be fair, I've never completed the uh, the dragons of um, uh, Autumn, Twi- Autumn Twilight. Is that the first one? You're joking me. I, no, the, the film. I've never completed the oh, film. okay. The cartoon film? Yeah. yeah. I can't do it. it. It is so bad on so many levels. Just put on. it on while you're doing something else. No, that's okay. not how that works. <laughs> okay. But no, I, uh, I yeah. I, wish, I hope when I die that heaven is like solace and I can go and eat <laughs> spiced potatoes from Ticker, you know, and Bar. I've actually got downstairs the uh, the official Dungeons and Dragons uh, cookbook. Yay! I, uh, so I, I do have and have made the spiced potatoes. I have too because I got to interview the authors for Dragon Plus. Oh, that's amazing! Because I'm a lucky little brat. So <laughs> that's like the best thing I've ever heard. To be honest, because I love that book. Oh, there's um there's a recipe in there for uh, bangers and smash. And that is a weekly thing I make because I love, love that recipe. It's so good. Well, if you and I ever meet up in real life, I will make you one of the desserts and bring it along. Yes. Yay. That's a cold idea. You come on down to Nottingham when we uh, we all go for the fluff and meat at when, Warhammer World. When is fluff and meat? The 23rd to the 25th of September. Okay, I'll try and make it. That would be fun. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Notting- it's going to be a lot of fun. Nottingham is the home of all things Games Workshop, right? Absolutely, it is. Yeah, yeah. My friend Angie, I think, lives that way. She is a famous painter. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me mm-hmm. let me just for a name mm-hmm. check on Twitter. Let let me promote another woman in the hobby. Absolutely. Hang on. Oh my God, the time. Have we <sighs> talked too long again? Oh, that's just what happens over it. The conversation just keeps on going. It's not just me, though, right? Oh, no, no. I, I'm well known for just talking. Damn it. Where is she? Well, I'll edit it right down so it'll be... Uh, oh, yeah, you are going to do an edit. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. Always, always do an edit. Okay, well, you can give me a minute while I look this up, then. Bear with. Mm-hmm. I mean, do, you, do you really think? Do you really think the bit where I was singing in order to play for time while I was trying to find the name of the book was going to end up? I mean, it might, but. Uh... Oh my god, I'd love that. <laughs> Angeli, okay, where is it? Boo, 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 boo. Yes, here we go. Oh, see, I'm nearly with you. Thank God you had to look something up as well. So now we are. Yes. I'm, I'm disappointed by the lack of song that went with it. Love lift us up and his song. Okay, <laughs> so Nottingham is the home of Games Workshop, and my friend Angeli lives there. She mm-hmm. is at Geek Girl Bookworm, no, uh, no Owen Worm, and okay. she is a painter of miniatures, and she calls herself Queen of Beholders, and her painting is amazing. Queen of Beholders? Um, yeah, so I would love I to... Think- Pop along, I think I follow her. Pop along to your fluff and hammer. 
Yes, maybe I will wear one of my um, Imperium dressing gowns. Cosplay. I don't know. Cosplay or Inquisitor or a Snotling. For years now, I've wanted to try to get people together to do like a uh, an Imperial Guard Regiment. You know, I'll do the cosplay of Imperial Guard Regiment just to turn up at various different events yes. and things. You know, like the, um, uh, oh, what they called? Like the Stormtrooper Squad. Yeah, um, I can't think what they're called now. It's, it's gone completely out of my head. Apparently I used to do stuff like that. They're mega corporate now. Um, just, Are they? Just quickly, before we depart from each other, I wrote mm -hmm. to my friend Ian. I'm learning about the Orc belief system. He wrote the 40k one, Gork and Mork. They're the gods. Okay. So oh. Gork and Mork are the gods, whilst the um, the belief system I was meaning was more the what they believe has a tendency of actually happening. Excellent. No, I, I will explain that to him, but I just knew you'd know who Gork and Mork were as well. <laughs> but, they are the biggest and the creepiest of gods. You, you must have conversations with Alex from 28 and Ian from Arbor to Ian. Uh, Alex. Alex is the main. Hayworth. Like, Alex. What uh, because I think I've just had a feeling off the top of my head, and I'm not entirely sure if I'm right or not. Uh. Oh, no, I'm, I'm thinking of Nurgling. Sorry, I'm thinking of the wrong person. <laughs> Alexander, his name begins with W, but I can introduce <clears> you. Are you. I mean, we're Discord buddies, aren't we? So I can introduce yes. you. Yes. I'll just do a group chat with me and you and him. <laughs> and then, you know, Ian from the YouTube videos, right? I do, yes, yeah. Sweet. So, yeah. I've been a lurker around a lot of these things for many, many years now. <laughs> it's like... Too scared to make myself noticed. Hello. That's okay. One of my best things that I do in the hobby is in, is put like good people together because I'm a huge believer in good people being connected. So mm -hmm. it's my honor <laughs> to kind of connect you with those and probably get two fantastic gold star podcasts. Whereas this is kind of like wooden spoon of podcasts when you get me. No, uh, uh, what we've done is we spent an hour talking about books, and as far as I'm concerned. That's gravy. Because, I mean, <laughs> these, these things are always going to be conversations about what's important and interesting to you. Because otherwise, if I'm just sitting here trying to ram raid and railroad you into conversation topics that don't really work, it is, that's the point. Conversation is always more interesting than interviews. That's a firm belief I've got. Yay. Well, it's very mm. enjoyable, it is. Good. I'm glad. Now, if you don't buy them, go back to 1874 and push some Victorian landowners off a bridge. You can do that. Just don't get your trebuchet out. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the police have asked me to stop doing that. It's yes. why I'm not allowed back at London Zoo. As bows are plenty. Cool penguins. <laughs> <laughs> Just the image of penguins being launched into the sky. <laughs> I can fly now, Mother. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfect place to end this now. Yeah. Would you like to pimp out where you can be found over the internet? I'm sure you have to know that you're on, but let's yeah, get just it done. Get, come find me at miramanga.com. If you have a creative endeavor that you think is awesome, please let me uh, amplify that and signal boost for you. Please share fun stuff with me and just hang out with me online. Yeah. And if you have any words of wisdom, negotiating the grim dark of the world of warhammer please do share no mansplaining but share fun stuff if I, I think if you get any mansplaining then uh, i will happily get the uh, two before out and we'll, we'll have words uh, it. at the end of the day we're all here we're all stuck on this falling rock that's slowly dying <laughs> well, what's the sentence we're all just barely evolved monkeys hanging on through a dying rock that's falling through space so let's enjoy it while we can. Oh, a light-hearted end. Indeed. I'm always there with a little bit of a smile, a cheer, and some happy nihilism. <laughs> <laughs> so with that then, I thank you very much, Vera. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been so lovely. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. Well, you're always welcome. Always welcome. Hope to see you on here again. Yeah. And we will see you all again soon. Good night, whatever shape you may be. Bye-bye. <laughs> 
strong one, I'm not nervous, I'm self as a quest with the earth is. I'm the mountains, I'm the churches, and I go cause I know what my worth is. I don't ask how hard the work is, got her off in the scrubs at the surface, time to flatten my mind, on my flatten my take what I'm handed, my great question man dance under the surface, I'll sit with surges, a tight rope walker in a free great circus, under the surface, we'll search your leads, never like you, I don't want to fund servers, under the surface, a pretty story mark, losing my time to be a service, a four track, a star in the stack, a person camel back, why a person camel's back, it's a selective drip, 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 that'll never stop, whoa, pressure that'll tip, 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 till you just go pop, whoa, oh, oh, give it to you, sis, your sister's all top, give her all the heavy things, we can't show top, who am I? If I can't roll with the ball, if I fall to pressure like a red, 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 and one I go, whoa, pressure like a tick, 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 till it's ready to blow, whoa, give it to your sister, your sister's rock, I'll see if she can hang on a little rock, I'm who am I, if I can't carry it all, if I fall to, under the surface, a hundred nerves and bursts, I'm hungry, something's gonna hurt us, under the surface, the shit doesn't swerve, hasn't hurt, I predict the iceberg is, under the surface, I think you're on purpose, can I see my whole surface, right up the top, you know, the light wind, oh, we try to stop the tumble, if we're not, it not, it goes on quick, Yeah.